All right. Uh, so, hey, everyone. As you heard, my name is Mark Dalgleish. And what I'm going to be doing today is uh, giving you a live demo of this relatively new library that I and uh, others have been working on called uh, Vanilla Extract. Now, as you can see here on the uh, official website on the left here, um, Vanilla Extract is all about zero runtime style sheets in TypeScript. The idea is really to try and bring these two you know, seemingly different worlds together, the world of static CSS and preprocessors, but the world of CSS and JS or CSS and TypeScript, and you know, having the same language um, across the entirety of your, your app, including your styles, being able to share uh, data, abstractions, and so on, uh, but, but without incurring the runtime cost that you typically expect with CSS and JS. Um, so rather than explain too much about how it works, what I want to do is show you what it looks like in practice. So here I have a basic app set up. I'm going to jump over to my Webpack app here, as you can see. Um, now, one thing I want to stress up front is we have integrations for uh, different bundlers. Uh, we have integrations for uh, ES Build, for Vite, uh, for Snowpack, um, and more in the future, I'm sure. Um, but today I'm just going to be showing you the Webpack version. So here what you can see is a basic React app. I've got my app component and it's rendering a header uh, with some text inside. And if we jump over to our header, um, you can see it's just rendering some children in an H1 node. But let's say we want to start adding some styles to this. How do we do this in the world of vanilla extract? So what you can see here over on the side is that I've already created this header.css.ts file. Now, this is one of the, the unique things about vanilla extract is that it feels more, you know, ergonomically, it feels more like working with something like CSS modules and SAS. Uh, but the difference here, of course, is that we're using TypeScript as our preprocessor. And we get full control over what we're exporting from the file. So you can see here where I'm exporting this root uh, class as it's, uh, as it's returned from this style function call. So what I'm going to do is start adding some styles to it. We'll say I want the background to be pink. And you'll see as I'm typing, I'm getting um, auto completion and type safety from uh, the, the CSS type library. I'm going to say that the foreground color here is blue. And I'm going to add some padding of, uh, let's say, 16 pixels. OK, so I've added some styles. Um, and if you've worked with CSS modules, this is going to look familiar to you. I'm going to do import star as styles from dot slash header dot CSS. Now, it says header dot CSS. It is the dot TS file. Um, there's no actual uh, CSS file on disk. This is all happening through the Webpack plugin. So I've got my styles object here. I can add a class name to my div. And what you'll see here is that if I hit styles dot, uh, my editor is already auto-completing this for me and telling me that there is a root class available. So if I add that, I hit save, you can see my UI has updated with my styles. Now, what's interesting, of course, is as you can see, it's all written in TypeScript. Um, but if I view the page source, you'll see in this HTML, if I scroll across, I've got a main.css file, a static CSS file on disk. And what's cool is that it's basically a one for one of what, I, of what I've written. So you can see that I've got my root class coming through here. It's been prefixed automatically for me. Again, this is something that if you've worked with CSS modules, this is something you're used to. You can see I've got my debuggable prefix there, uh, but there's a hash there at the end. So when I ship to production, it's just going to be those hashes coming through. And there are all those, those styles as I wrote them before. So there's, there's zero runtime cost. Again, you can think of it just like using CSS modules in SAS, where all the code that's in that CSS TS file runs at build time, and that's it, um, no runtime cost at all. Now, the next thing I guess that's really interesting about vanilla extract that's worth calling out is we're big on type safety and we're big on local scoping. And it's not just about class names. It's importantly, when it comes to things like design systems, you want to have that same level of DX around your themes. Um, so let's say that these hard-coded values here are actually going to come from our theme palette, uh, maybe a collection of CSS variables. What I can do is I can create a new file here that I'll call theme.css.ts, and I'm going to create some CSS variables. So export const vars equals, and I'm going to create a global theme, as we call it. Now, it's global in the sense that I'm attaching it to a selector. This is a common pattern if your app uh, basically has a single theme. Um, if you've got multiple themes, you can uh, there are versions of this that return a class name for that theme, that, so you can swap it in and out, but I'm going to keep it simple today. What's cool about this is that I can create a nested tree of variables. So here I'm going to have my colors, and let's say, uh, you know, just to keep it simple, I'm going to say I've got blue, uh, uh, pink, aqua, I can type aqua, try that again, and uh, navy. There we go, I've got a few colors. And then we're going to add a space scale as well. So we'll add space of small as uh, eight pixels. Let's just say medium, large, we'll go up from to 16 and 32. Not a very realistic scale, but there we go. We've got our colors and our space. So if we jump back over to our header.css.ts file, I can start to replace these with CSS variables. But what's cool is that um, 
you know, as I've said, it's all type safe um, and it's got that nested structure. So I can say vars.colors. And you see, I'm getting auto completion here of all of my CSS variables. Um, so here we've got our, you know, pink background. Let's to mix it up. Let's use the aqua version. Hit save. You'll see the background has changed. I'll change the foreground here. Um, same deal. We're going to say vars.colors. Uh, blue, and then the padding here, vars .space medium, And of course, being type safe, you know, if I've got a typo anywhere like that, if I've you know, left a couple of letters off, I'm going to get my editor telling me that that's not a valid CSS variable. Um, in the same way that you expect from CSS, something like CSS modules where you've got your hash class names, we also have hashed variables. So if I jump into the, uh, the style sheet again, we have another look. You can see there's our root selector for setting up all of our CSS variables. They've got debug names at the start there, as we've come to expect. These are only in development. Then you've got the hashes at the end. So in production, you, your styles are going to be referencing these hashed variables. Everything's going to be nice and lean. Um, another thing that's worth noting as well is that because this is all happening at build time, we're able to tie our localized uh, classes and variable names to the file that it came from. So you have a single hash per file. And there's just a, a single counter at the end here. You can see zero, one, two, three. So that means that the compression is, is really, really good, especially the more styles you put in, in the singular file, which is very common in a design system, having a, a central theme file like this. Um, cool. Um, now, the next thing that's that's worth calling out here is that you know this is all still very basic uh, flat styling, what you would expect from CSS modules. But when you work in a component system, often what you want to be able to do is have namespaces of styles that map to props is a very common pattern. So for example, let's say that this this header component, I want to be able to have a prop that can change the background color and can change the foreground color for me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to introduce this new concept here of style, what we call style variants. So I'm going to create a background style uh, collection of style variants. Now style variants uh, lets you pass an object here where you can create named sets of styles. Um, the other thing that's useful here uh, in terms of what we're doing is you can actually map over an object. So what I'm going to do is pass in the, our entire color palette, and I'm going to map over that. So in this case, it's mapping to the background. And what I can say is for every single CSS variable that I just passed in, um, map it to um, a style that sets the background. And I can do the same for the foreground. So if I change this one to color, um, we now have collections of styles for background and color. I'm going to delete these two here. Um, so our colors are going to disappear. But that means we're now ready to reintroduce them at the component layer. So here we've got our interface for the component for the props. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add a new prop here called background. And what's cool is that because our style sheet is written in TypeScript, we also get access to the types that are coming from it. So I can say here that the background is actually key of type of styles dot background. I can use this, this, the style variance object that I've exported as the source of truth for the types here of the props. So I can do the same thing for the color as well. And I can, of course, name these whatever I want, but I'm going to keep it fairly straightforward. And that means that these props now are going to be coming through here. So I've got our background prop and our color prop. I'm going to map these through to this class name. Um, so of course, what I'm going to do before I go much further is make sure that I'm joining them with a space. So now we can make these dynamic. I can say that I want to apply the background, and it's going to use the background prop uh, looking up on that style variance object. And I'm going to do the same thing for the foreground color that. Okay, so what's cool is that you'll see nothing's changed visually here in terms of the colors, but we are getting a type error now from our app component because the header component is no is not providing these required props. So if I start typing in here background, you'll see I'm getting auto completion of the available backgrounds, and again tracing that through, that's because um, you know the type of the background is from the key of the type of our background styles inside of our header CSS file. So it means whatever I define here ends up being the the prop interface of this component. So I'm going to set the background here to be uh, pink again, like we had before. And still getting a type error because I need to set the foreground color. And we'll go with blue. And there we go. So what you can see is, again, what, what we're getting is um, you know, type safe styles with zero runtime. I'm just generating plain CSS files. Um, if I view page source here, um, again, all, all the way through, it's just a plain CSS file coming out the other end um, with no runtime cost. Now, if you're like me and you're working on a design system, you know this sort of um, you know low-level atomic mapping code. Effectively, you know I have a single class for each background color. I have a single class for each foreground color. This concept is not really uh, coupled to the idea of this header component. This is a generic app-wide concept that I want to be able to reuse classes. And if you've ever worked with something like Tailwind, then you're definitely used to this idea of being able to reuse these classes throughout your app and being very utility-first. Um, so this is something that we use uh, in our own work with Vanilla Extract uh, at Seek, where I work in Australia. 
And to make this easier, what we have is actually a first class official package that's part of the vanilla extract monorepo uh, called Sprinkles. Now you can think of Sprinkles as basically like the tailwind of vanilla extract. But the difference here is that um, we're leaning heavily into TypeScript and having type safety and uh, type safe functional interfaces for our, for our classes rather than you know, manually building up these, these strings that you typically get with, with utility class frameworks. So in order to make this work, what we're gonna do is jump down here and we've got a bit of a starting kit here that I can grab. I'm going to highlight all this code um, and I'm going to drop it in my theme file. Paste that import to the top. So we've still got our vars. We're going to use our vars as the source of truth. Um, I'm going to delete the space here that's come with our little template and um, we've got colors here as well. I'm going to delete those. So already you can see we're getting, you know, as always, we're getting type errors uh, that's going to make things a bit easier for us uh, to fix it up. So rather than it just being space, I want it to be vars.space. And then down here, uh, we want it to be vars.color. So we're using our, our CSS variables as a source of truth for what these pattern, uh, the values of these atomic classes should be. Now what I'm going to do to keep it lean, I'm just going to delete the things we're not going to use today. I'm just going to keep it uh, simple, um, but we have what's neat is we've got shorthands here as well. So we've got padding, padding X and padding Y that just map to these low level top, bottom, left, right. We also have color styles here as well. Um, the reason for the separation is we have different conditions, which I'll get into shortly, but it means that we can very easily in a type safe way, customize the styles that we want across different screen sizes or different color modes. And this is all configurable. You, your conditions can be based on media queries or selectors or whatever you want. Okay, and then at the bottom here, what you'll see is we're exporting this Atoms function. And that's what gives us the type safe uh, interface to these atomic classes that we've configured. Now this function can be used inside of your CSS TS file. So I could replace these with Atoms uh, calls if I wanted to. But what I'm actually gonna do is show that, um, you know, the real power of this approach is that this Atoms function can be used at runtime. Uh, what, what I'm gonna do to keep things simple, I'm gonna roll back to a component that doesn't accept any props. So we'll just delete these uh, background and foreground colors. Jump in here, these are, these are now gone. What I'm gonna do instead of having this um, CSS file, is I'm just gonna use my low level atoms function directly. So here we're gonna say atoms, um, and that's coming in from my theme file, I've got this atoms function. I'm gonna say that I want the padding to be uh, large, medium, small, you can see here. So these, are, again, it's all type safe. It's coming from our sprinkles configuration that we just looked at before. I'm gonna make that medium. Um, what I'm gonna do here now is set the background to be uh, pink as we saw before. And I'm going to set the foreground color to be blue. Again, same styles as we've had before. So we're, we're basically back where we started. But what's interesting is if I open up the dev tools and I inspect this element, what you'll see uh, is that we've got atomic classes for everything. We've got background, foreground, padding, right, left, bottom, top. Um, if I view the, again, view the, the resulting CSS file that's being generated, you'll see we've got um, all of our variables up top. We've got all these atomic uh, reusable classes. Um, it, defined for different breakpoints. That we've got our tablet styles, our desktop styles here. And then at the bottom here, we've got our, our um, dark mode colors as well uh, for uh, color and for background classes. So, you know, because this is all statically built into a CSS file with a, a function that just maps to those at runtime, it means there's actually zero, effectively zero runtime cost apart from the, the lookup of, of mapping to these pre-existing classes. But what's neat about what we've done here is that we can start to do much more advanced things than, than just mapping these simple values. Because we set up our conditions, uh, we have conditions for padding and colors that behave slightly differently. What we're gonna do here is say that for padding, we want on mobile to be small, then on tablet, we want it to be medium, and then on desktop, we want it to be large. And one thing I wanna stress is that this naming convention is just something I've come up with. You can name these whatever you want. Um, you can map it to whatever media query you want and so on. Um, so that means now that I've made that padding um, responsive, you can see as I resize my window, the padding is changing. And because this is, you know, this is, this is in my runtime layer, it means I can actually map these values through to props and I can make this uh, as configurable at runtime as I want. The other thing that's, uh, that I can do here as well, as you, as you would have seen before, is that I can start to target light mode and dark mode. So I'm gonna say in light mode, I want it to be uh, pink, but then in dark mode, I want it to be, uh, we'll, we'll flip it around and we'll say blue. Now my, my um, OS is set to dark mode, so you'll see the color actually just flip for me. So what I'm gonna do is um, do the same thing here for the foreground, um, but we'll go with the opposite. We'll say that in light mode, the foreground's blue, and then in dark mode, uh, it is pink. So if I open up my dev tools uh, and I bring up this panel here, if I scroll down, you can see here I can emulate preferred, mother, uh, preferred color scheme. I can switch between light and dark mode. And that's just alternating between, uh, it, because I've applied classes for both of these states, um, they're swapping in and out for me. 
Um, and again, if you look at the resulting markup in the page, you're seeing that I've got a lot more classes now. Um, but the good thing is that this is mainly for development again. So you've got all these prefixes here of theme background, theme color, theme padding, and so on. Um, in production, this will just be a wall of hashes and um, end up being a lot shorter than what you're seeing here. And again, if we, uh, if we view source, uh, even though it's all dynamic for, between light mode and dark mode, um, what we've done is we've sort of um, invested in this lean set of classes up front. And then at runtime, there's, beyond that, there's, there's, no, there's no real cost for that. And this is what you're seeing here is, is really the basis for all of the work that we've been doing at Seek in our design system. And in practice, what we found is that we can build this really lean, reusable, highly compressible set of classes and then move uh, a lot of the, the logic for swapping in, the, uh, swapping in and out of these classes to the runtime where the ergonomics start to feel a lot like your traditional runtime CSS and JS solutions, but without the performance cost because we're just referencing these pre-built atomic classes. So I, hopefully you find that interesting in the sense that you can see that there's room for some of these approaches that try to bridge the worlds between static CSS um, and pre-processes and knowing that there's zero runtime cost in, in all of that work, but then having the, the, the ergonomics of a runtime CSS and JS solutions and being able to integrate your styles into your component APIs and so on. Um, so that's it. If, you, if you're interested in uh, trying it for yourself, I do encourage you to check it out, vanilla-extract.style. And... Uh, try it out and let me know what you think. I'd love to hear how it goes. And um, that's it for me. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much. That was a lovely talk. And I mean, I'm going to use myself now vanilla extract for my side projects. So it, it was really amazing. Uh, we have a quick question from Oli. Uh, so he says that to get the most out of vanilla extract, would all the styles buy in vanilla extract? Would there ever be a good use case to have something in line out of vanilla extract? Yeah, so I think the way I think about this is it's, again, it's it's really no different to the way you think about working with something like CSS modules in SAS in terms of the trade-offs, because if you want to do something at runtime and you're using static CSS, you may have to reach for an inline style in that sort of a scenario. But I guess where what's interesting now that we have CSS variables is that you can make your CSS variables dynamic at runtime as well. So vanilla extract, I didn't touch on it today, but vanilla extract has a special package, um, you know, slash dynamic is the, the name of the package in, in the um, in the namespace. And what that lets you do is have a sort of a first class type safe API for changing the value of variables uh, at runtime. And so that lets you, that's another way that you can sort of have the best of both worlds where you can write the static styles, put dynamic placeholders in there in the form of CSS variables, and then swap those out at runtime as well. So that gives you a little bit more control um, to do things like uh, that you you typically can't do with inline styles. So for example, you could have variables for different breakpoints and have them applied as inline styles that inline styles typically can't do, you know, responsive styling. So we have a lot more tools available to us to do that now um, than we used to. We have Samoli who says that it looks amazing. We'll definitely try it out. So good on that. Uh, just a quick question on uh, a performance wise uh, compared to other CSS and JS. Do you do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I mean, so that's really you know wh where this work is coming from is from the perspective of you know obviously with my involvement in CSS modules, we invested in that ecosystem really really early and. The entirety of our design system, uh, you know, lineage going back many, many years at this point, was all built on this assumption that there's zero runtime cost, and we we scaled that up through a large company, right? And so the challenge for us was that um, we wanted to move more and more towards the, the benefits of CSS and JS or CSS and TypeScript particularly, um, but we were worried about pushing out a runtime to these consumers that were already used to the performance characteristics of static CSS, and um, so you know I'm. I'm not against the idea of runtime CSS in JS per se, but it's more that, you know, in that sort of environment, it felt like, you know, we, we felt like we wanted to do the right thing and see like, do we really need to introduce a runtime or is there a way that we can kind of have the best of both worlds? And um, so what you're looking at really is what does it look like to, to maintain that same performance profile of effectively zero runtime? It's just static CSS files. And the only, the only runtime really is just the typical lookup that you would have to do anyway with any static CSS solution. Um, and, and beyond that, there is there is zero runtime cost at all. So 
it's going quite extreme in terms of the trade-offs um, and trying to see how far we can push it. The, some of the trade-offs there, of course, as you've seen, is we've got a separate file that you have, that you have to worry about and that, that export, export um, static export boundary. But we actually find that in practice, that actually helps people understand, you know, where is that boundary between the code that runs at build time the code that runs at runtime and it's clear that there's no anything that's in that CSSTS file can be as expensive as you want. It's not going to hit your users. Um, so I'll just ask a question here too. So are you actually running all the .css.ts files during build time to compile them? Yeah, so that's one of the reasons we went for that sort of approach is it makes it really easy to signal to the bundler that this is this is a point at which we actually need to spin up a child compiler, um, compile that in, in, into its own separate context that we eval, um, and all CSS that gets generated go um, gets output into these virtual CSS files, and all the exports. Uh, that's just those are the things that are left in the file. So the fact that there's that boundary, um, that such a clear boundary as well, has made it really easy for us to port to other bundlers. So like getting into ES Build, for example, was really trivial. Um, because we didn't have to do any AST work at all. It's literally just if we see that extension, we know spin that one up and it's uh, in a separate process. Cool. So maybe this question is for all of you. Uh, where do you see uh, CSS and TS heading in next few years? It seems like there has been a recent boom in zero runtime CSS. Maybe. Uh, Mark, do you want to take it? Yeah, I mean, uh, th this is a tricky one because I think, um, you know, so with CSS modules, I think it was really obvious from the beginning that it had the potential to be really big because it looked and felt like regular CSS files and it integrated seamlessly with existing CSS tooling. You know, like you could plug SAS into it and auto prefixer and post CSS, whatever. Like it just felt like it was part of the CSS ecosystem. You could hand it to uh, an ostensibly, you know, CSS focused developer and they feel right at home. Whereas what we're looking at here with CSS and TS, it feels like it's got a bit more of a hurdle to get over to get more of that main, mainstream adoption outside of maybe, you know, people at, at a conference like this are perfectly happy with the idea of CSS and TS. Um, I think, you know, your more traditional CSS developer is going to have a harder time coming to terms with the idea that they're completely flipping out uh, the language to something like TypeScript. Um, I'd like to think that with the right uh, approach of presenting it to them and maybe writing specific articles or creating specific videos for that audience, knowing that they might be more skeptical. I think that the benefits of type safety are what pushes it above and beyond JavaScript as, as, a, as a sales pitch. Because I think if you looked at what we were doing before, it was for them, it's much easier uh, to write it off and say, well, you're, you're just using JavaScript. Like I don't see that as, as such an advantage. Um, you know, to that audience. But if you say, look at the, you know, look at what I'm doing with CSS variables here, where I'm actually getting like auto completion, type safety. I know for a fact that all these variables I'm referencing do exist. And if someone deletes this variable, my app will get a type error. Like that starts to, you're starting to see things that even a, a die in the wool, like traditional CSS developer is going to have a hard time saying that's a bad idea. I think they're going to start to say, okay, there's something interesting here. It might take a bit longer. So, you know, you're talking about the next few years. I, I think that that's probably maybe the sort of time frame you're looking at. I mean, even CSS modules took a while to become the sort of safe, boring choice. I think, you know, there's room for some of these CSS and TypeScript solutions to get to the same place, but I, it might be more of an uphill battle, I think. Okay, there's one more question for you, Mark. I think you mentioned the theming part a bit, but is it possible to create nested themes easily, toggle between them? Yeah, so in order to keep the demo simple today, I used create global theme, but we also have just a create theme API. And what that returns to you is a tuple of the of the theme class itself and the vars. So then it's up to you to then put that class somewhere in your document. Um, that obviously means there's a little bit more wiring up to do on your part. Um, which is why I didn't do it today. Um, but in our system, that's what we do. We have a, a, a system with multiple themes that you can swap in and out. Um, the other thing that's really cool as well, it's, this is more advanced usage of vanilla extract, but um, we also give you the ability to create theme contracts in isolation. Um, why that's useful is it means you can bundle split your themes and you can say that um, you can, like every, um, like your app code imports the theme contract and has access to the var names, but it, it's up to you at runtime to decide, well, which implementation of that theme contract am I going to use? So from vanilla extracts perspective, we support every 
uh, theming use case from you know the one global app uh, theme for your app all the way through to like lots of separate themes that are bundle split and optimized that way. So it's we we handle whatever whatever you need to do there. Thank you. We have another question. Will vanilla extract support CSS co-location or co-placing styles in the same component? Yeah, this is like the number one question we get with this library because it's definitely one of the biggest trade-offs we've made. Um, we, I would say we've internally we've debated this one quite a bit earlier on, and I've you know I've I've often been the one trying to challenge ourselves to be like, you know, is this something we really need? People don't like it. Um, I think ultimately what it comes back to though is. At some point, there has to be a boundary between the code that's going to run at build time, the code that's going to run at runtime. The challenge with putting it in the same file is it's very easy for you to write code that just does not make sense because you're trying to do things that, you know, you're trying to reference things that actually don't exist at runtime. Um, and so then you have to introduce things like lint rules and, you know, to guard against people doing things that don't make sense and so on. Um, Whereas if you if you put it in the separate file, effectively, you know, in my mind, the re the reason why it, it it feels right in practice is it's going with the grain of JavaScript in the sense that the the export boundary of a module is static. Like you're you're actually forced to think about it in that sense. Like I can do all this work in my CSSTS file, but I have to sort of at you know upfront decide these are the things I'm exporting from my file, and so. It, it, it means that there's no longer this sort of confusion of like my React code's trying to reference variables that I defined in my styling code that actually should be gone at runtime. Um, and it just makes it makes it much easier to reason about. Um, it also helps with the, you know, this is not the reason we do it, but it also pays off in other ways in that um, it means there's a lot less work for us to do to figure out where that boundary is and integration with different bundlers and different environments is, is a lot more straightforward for us as well. But I, I, I would say the main reason is about making it feel natural in the language that the, the that boundary is 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 inherently static thank you for that uh what are some of the interesting projects that you're following outside of your own maybe to well, all of you this question is like to all of you well i'm interested to see stylex <laughs> very interested and, <laughs> And Naman, maybe you can yeah, go. I, I've actually been looking <laughs> at Vanilla Extract, and uh, I learned way more today because I wasn't completely familiar with sprinkles. And uh, just a little extra add-on to the last question. I think at St uh, with Stylex, we've kind of made the other uh, the other choice where we do co-locate styles in the same file. And but other than that, I feel like we're trying to follow many of the same things. It's typed, it's uh, static and all of that. So uh, I think it's very interesting because other than that one decision, we're both chasing exactly the same goals. Andre, do you want to add something? Yes, I, I tend to remain unbiased towards any CSS in JS library because I like to try all of them and understand each of them and and the understand where they basically fit in, in a particular project. Um, I've used uh, I've used Treat, uh, which is the father, grandfather, I don't know how to call it, uh, the grandfather of a vanilla, vanilla extract. Uh, and we are planning to switch uh, also to, to migrate to vanilla extract. So that's one, one library that, um, uh, yeah, that really, really makes sense to me and I follow it. Another one would be, uh, I would say, Goober. Goober is a, a, a library that has a runtime a runtime overhead. So it's, uh, a, for, from my perspective, it better suits like highly dynamic applications uh, on single page applications. And I will debate on this uh, during my talk and uh, we'll debate the performance of both these approaches as well. Uh, but yeah, Goober, because uh, it's probably the most lightweight uh, and also like really rich in features. Uh, uh, so yeah, that's that's one uh, one library that I really, really am, I'm impressed. I'm really impressed. 